Hello and welcome to Current Affairs on JTV, the global Jewish channel. Today we're discussing, is the peace process dead? Joining me in the JTV studio is Noru Salik of the Times of Israel, Arya Miller, Director of the Zionist Federation, Ethan Schwartz from Yahad and Khalila Lancaster from the New Israel Fund. Panelists, thank you for joining us uh, today. So, as the question suggests, is the peace process dead? Arya. Um, no. Uh, it's a very short answer to a very complicated question. But there's no negotiations um, going on. Uh, there is a lull in the peace process that is completely it's been a very long lull. It has been a very long lull, although it, actually there were negotiations happening up to as late as 2014 um, uh, on various different issues and since 2014 as well. Uh, not on a kind of general peace process, but on little bits of land, for example, Ruabi. Uh, which for me is the reason that the answer is no, the peace process isn't dead. Uh, okay, okay. Let, let me go, Ethan, what do you think? Um, I agree with Arya that the peace process is, isn't dead. Um, and also, on the point of negotiations, we don't know what's currently being negotiated. There's, the reality is that there's a, a huge amount of contact that we don't know about, and it's not in the public domain. Um, in terms of the actual process started at Oslo, it's clear that there have been problems. It's clear that the process, as we talk about process a lot, isn't really fit for purpose as it's currently constituted. But does that mean that the peace process is dead and there'll never be a political solution to the conflict? No. Okay, Kalela, do you share the optimism here? Look, I, come from the, I work in the New Israel Fund and we work uh, with civil society inside Israel. So my answer is going to come from that perspective. Um, and from, you know, from our point of view, there's an issue within Israel around uh, the perception of this concept of peace and the perception of the concept of process as well. That's what I work in and that's what I want to talk about. Um, and you're saying within Israel? Within well. Israel. Obviously on the Palestinian side as well, but that's not something that I have strong expertise in. Um, I can say within Israel, um, there, is still, uh, uh, there is still a majority of support. Uh, polls have shown, you know, the, the, from the Israel Democracy uh, Peace Index and so forth, um, polls have shown that there is still support for this concept of a two-state solution. Okay, so where's the problem then? If there's still support, where's it? There is support for the, the well. <laughs> the, the problem is the policies. The problem is that the policies are uh, not. You mean the policies of the current? The government? policies of the current government are not going in the, that direction. But also, the support for the two-state solution that there is in theory amongst the uh, 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 Israeli public and specifically the Israeli Jewish public, which is significant, is not necessarily being translated into public pressure. Uh, at the moment, and that's what that where that's where the work of civil society that we are working that we are supporting is coming in and is so important. And there is a revitalization of work in that arena. In I fact, see Nora is dying to come in. <laughs> Why do we need a peace process? We don't need a peace process. We need peace. And I, those of us who are not uh, blinded by ideology, those like me who don't care much about ideology, remember that Israel actually has achieved peace. Well, I mean, we're not starting from scratch here. We made peace with Egypt, we made peace with Jordan, we made peace with Lebanon, okay, that peace treaty has been cancelled by Lebanon after they assassinated their leader. We signed agreements towards peace with the Palestinians. How did that happen, Alan? It didn't happen through pressure, through some sort of grand international conference. It happened through direct negotiations without preconditions. And when did it happen? It happened as soon as there was an Arab leader willing to take our hand extended in peace. As soon as there was such an Arab leader, the Israeli leadership at the time, whether it was right wing or left wing, you know, Menachem Begin and, and so on, they rose to the opportunity and they made the necessary concessions. And so let's, you're saying it has to come No, no, let's, the let's, remember, let's remember what those concessions no, no, were. No, wait a second, Laura. You're saying it has to come from the Palestinian side. You're saying when a leader from that I side think emerges, there was, I think there needs to be an Arab leader willing to take Israel's hand extended in peace. Netanyahu, the much reviled Netanyahu, I mean, we, you know, some of us don't like Netanyahu. That's absolutely fine. But Netanyahu, only uh, in, in, at the end of last year uh, has re-expressed his support for the two-state solution. He, he said in public with Federica Mogherini, the uh, UE uh, representative, the EU representative, sorry, 
uh, he said, I don't want a one state, I want the two state solution, I want two states for two people. And I'd like Kalela and Ethan to bring me a, 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 a quote from a Palestinian leader that says two states for two people. Just that simple expression, I because mean, they don't say that. They say that two states, and what they mean is two states. Okay. One, pa one purely Palestinian and one with Palestinian majority. I mean, that, that has been said, and you can just look at the Geneva Initiative, uh, for example, which has documented, you know, a, 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 a whole a comprehensive solution that was agreed upon by uh, senior Palestinian figures and representatives that was agreed, of the PA. Wait, that I was I'm never sorry, I just agreed want to, upon. That was a side show that but you asked, nobody you asked, you asked, bring, You said, bring me a Palestinian you know, leader who said this, and I'm saying that it's been said, and it's been said by An Abu Mazen. An official Palestinian but I just, leader I want to who say represents so, the I want Palestinian. To, I, want to just, I want to just return some something else. I believe that, I think that you're right insofar as um, the leadership needs to articulate a will for peace. But there also has to be uh, a sense within, uh, in order for the leadership to do so, there needs to be a sense that there is a strong uh, a need from a self-interested point uh, place to achieve a two-state, to achieve a two-state solution. And from Israel's point of view, uh, uh, it means ending the occupation and uh, freeing itself of this um, uh, moral quagmire that it's got itself in. And the current leadership... That's what the peace process is about. The current leadership doing is focused on conflict management, not conflict resolution. I, Ethan, yeah, I, know, I just want to go back on this idea that peace is somehow ideological and, and the, the oh, people no, who I didn't support say peace that. are somehow... I didn't say that. You know, the idea of supporting the negotiations... The bashing of Israel is, is, is ideological. ideological. <laughs> because the reality is that in Israeli politics today, the people who are the strongest proponents of negotiations, a two-state solution, are the realist military establishment. The organizations like Commanders for Israel Security, the Council of Peace and Security, the gatekeepers, uh, you know, tons of former heads of IDF, IDF officers, Shimbet, Mossad. These are the people who are currently calling for Israel to return to the negotiating table, who are currently calling for Israel to end the occupation because they know that it's bad for Israeli security. That's, that's the reality today. The people who are ideological are the people who are, are saying that Israel needs to maintain every inch of land, Israel needs to put more settlements, Israel needs to annex Area C of the West Bank, the right wing of the Likud, the Bayi Yehudi, those are the ideological drivers in Israel today. Ari, let me come back to something you started with, which was, you know, little deals are being done here and there, a patch of land here, a patch of land there. That is a strategy some people are advocating, isn't it? Don't yeah, go for absolutely. some grand scheme, just go for a peace pipe, manage the, go for conflict management, and then try and just chip away until you get to the core issues. Absolutely. Do you I think that will work? Yeah, I, th I really do think it will work. I think. Uh, we're in a scenario at the moment, and uh, it's said a lot that at the moment, all peace process historically has been uh, what do we want to gain and what, uh, what are the negotiations about, uh, rather than what can we agree on and then expanding from that. Uh, I think if we start from where we agree and places like Ruabi, uh, I call it kind of, it's not just the Perez Center. There are lots of kind of points of light within Israel itself and also Israel and its neighbors. Uh, where negotiations are moving forward very positively. Ruabi is one example of a very successful process of negotiation with hiccups along the way and speed bumps, but that came to a positive conclusion of utilities, of water, of transport, of security, of all of, all of the bits that need to make up a peace process were decided within this one small enclave. Now, if we can take that and expand it to the country, uh, then that's fantastic. I think we talk about a generational shift at the moment, particularly here in the UK, of uh, what the young people coming through our community, are, what their relationship with Israel is based on. Um, and my grandparents' relationship with Israel was based on Israel not existing to Israel existing. Um, uh, my parents' generation and older uh, was based on uh, Six Day War, Yom Kippur War, the very real threat that Israel may not exist. And my generation and a little bit older 
Um, remember a peace process. Remember Rabin's assassination. Remember uh, the peace process existing and not existing. The younger generation at the moment didn't grow up through a peace process, didn't grow up through the real existential threat to Israel. And so for them, um, Israel will always exist, no matter what. Uh, and they don't believe that peace is a reality. I want to say yeah. about that. Well, I was going to say, does that vision inspire? I, well, I want to say, uh, just as you're saying about uh, British Jewish youth, I mean, Karl Vachomer, about uh, what's going on for young people in Israel today. Uh, and what you can see is the impact of the lack of peace and the sustained and prolonged occupation that Israel has on uh, that has on it on attitudes within Israeli society in quite a devastating way, and you can see statistics, uh, you know, of Israeli youths um, regarding racism and attitudes towards the other that are really quite shocking and very very upsetting. And I, you know, I know what I'm talking about. I lived in Israel for 13 years, and I had my children in Israel, uh, and in there in Ghanim in Israel, and, and I mean I've experienced, you know, I, I'm not just talking about it from an outside kind of point of view. Um, and, and you're saying this makes it I'm more saying, difficult to reach peace. I'm saying, and obviously on the Palestinian side, I'm saying that the absence of peace is having an effect uh, 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 of entrenching, uh, you know, it's a cycle. It's entrenching attitudes that make it very difficult to then make peace. And obviously on the Palestinian side too, uh, the Palestinians are looking for justice. I mean, that's one thing that we know is that Israelis like to talk about peace. They don't anymore so much, but traditionally they like to talk about peace mm -hmm. and Palestinians like to talk about justice. Okay. And th that's my response also to well, the well, earlier well, well. question about Rawabi and so forth, because these, you know, this little piece by piece approach does not, does not address the Palestinian need for justice, right. which let's, the Palestinian street and the youth I, I, I are that. striving I for. Are the Israelis becoming more racist and is that impact on peace? And is this the justice question? This isn't going to solve justice, is it? One piece at a time. Racism exists everywhere. It exists, unfortunately, in Israel, not at higher levels than anywhere else, despite what Kalela says. Do you think it is higher levels in Israel? Do you? Yes. And, and with, with, all, with all due respect, I, I agree with Kalela on one thing, and that's a problem. Israelis talk about peace. We want peace. Palestinians talk about justice. Unfortunately, I'm all for justice. You know, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof. But the problem is, when they talk about justice, what really are they talking about? They're talking about turning the clock backwards to a time when uh, 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 Israel did not exist and there was some sort of mythical Palestinian heaven uh, there. They're talking they about to, their right to self-determination, well, just like we have our right to self-determination. I'm all for Palestinians' uh, right of self-determination. And actually, if you, if you listen, you would have heard the Israeli ambassador to the UK reaffirming the support of Israel for the Palestinian right of self-determination. Speaking to students in Oxford, he said exactly that. Right. Now, well, the, we're going to have to stop there. Legendary, I, I was ambitious the, thinking we could solve this problem <laughs> in 12 minutes. We haven't, but I want to thank you for your time for joining us today. And thank you all at home. Join us again soon for another episode of Current Affairs on JTV.